Hey everybody, it's Talknosis, and I'm really excited and happy to have uh, Dr. Alan Greenfield on the show. Uh, the last time Alan was on was about a decade ago, which is way too long. I'm a huge fan of his work. I, I give everybody the same intro, uh, Alan, and uh, and then I usually say this, I give everybody the same intro, but it's true. We, you know, we basically started the sh show so that we could talk to people who we admire, whose work has moved us, and have something to share with the world. And I think that's that's definitely you. Um, I'm hoping that the people who already know your work are, are tuning in, but you know, there's going to be, you know, probably literally a thousand or two thousand people who uh, who are going to be watching or listening to this who don't know you. So I, I usually don't do a biography, but I was wondering, and this could be a whole show, you've lived a rich life, but I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about yourself and, and a bit about your spiritual autobiography. Okay. The case uh, I wish you hadn't ordered it, have lived a rich life. Yes, I have. Yeah, sorry, you're hey, living a rich life. Good day. But uh, despite the fact that I, I will come from the beyond, and I am beyond, I'm not yet beyond, if you follow what I'm saying. Yes. So, uh, I mean, that's the area I deal with. I have been involved in paranormal work, uh, in uh, ufology, and in alternative spirituality since 1960. That kind of dates me, you know, back when the dinosaurs ruled the earth, I was born. But uh, uh, it's just a lifelong interest with me. And uh, uh, my emphasis uh, for a long time was in ufology. Then it sort of migrated to the occult, although I have never abandoned ufology because I eventually realized uh, after much trial and error, that uh, uh, the various fields, so-called, uh, involving uh, neurotheology, theology, uh, which is was my original, you know, graduate work at the University of Arizona. Um, never did anything with that, but uh, you know, it makes very literate conversation. And uh, I got involved with uh, the OTO, which I will not talk about because I, I spent 20 years there. I was uh, made a bishop in the OTO, which uh, uh, is not applicable now because uh, we got a divorce, I guess you could say, <laughs> so, a long time ago, actually. Um, I... I have used the term following uh, uh, an earlier practitioner, congregational illuminism. I have clarified that to free illuminism and prefer the term, although, you know, I will accept uh, if, if it's a group of people, it's a congregation by almost by definition. I just uh, have come to realize that, first of all, all of these different uh, supposedly separate areas, cryptozoology, ufology, Gnosticism, uh, uh, conventional religion, spirituality, they all are different aspects of the same animal. And once I realized that, I mean, the thread that unites them, I think, is uh, quantum physics, which I came to relatively late, about 20 years ago, but... Uh, uh, that's, you know, half of my field experience. I realized it's just different masks. Uh, Joseph Campbell, in the early days of his work, uh, did a book called The Masks of God. And I think that term applies here. Uh, so um, I prefer non-sectarian terminology. It's like I will still, on occasion, do a consecration, but I prefer to call it an empowerment. Uh, during the course of the uh, Great Arabian Mountain working, which was 10 years long, I probably empowered or facilitated having empowered uh, maybe 100 people. Um, I prefer that term, empowerment, because consecration, although it's certainly true. I mean, my begots, you know, go back as far as you can go back in maybe four different lineages. 
but I prefer to think of it as an egregore empowerment rather than something that has specifically uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic connotations. I mean, I was on UFO Hunters once, and the host, Bill Burns, who is a fellow Jew, first question was, how can you be bishop and a Jew? And I said, uh, it's a Masonic title, which was the best I could come up with for that length of time. But, you know, that that is close enough. I mean, uh, on the site where I cite my begots, which is not something I refer to that often, there's a little section that says what Alan Greenfield really believes, which is not quite true because I don't believe anything. I think I speculate subject to uh, new inputs, but it goes straight to the Reformed Judaism site and uh, the most recent declaration from there. So I don't know if that's an overwinded or underwinded answer, but there you no, go. No, that's how that's we are here. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll have to link in the show notes uh, uh, to to the website that you mentioned uh, what Alan Greenfield actually believes. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting. You know, some people are, are going to be turning off the show or, you know, running away when they hear about ufology or uh, I can never say it right, ufology. Um, but we had a ufology. Most people. Um, I'm a second gen ufologist. All the first geners are dead. Uh, some of my generation have gone on to their reward in a great UFO in the sky. But uh, uh, the term ufology is, has fallen into uh, ufology. It's just, I get, and you know, I'm way too polite, way too Southern to, to correct people, but it's ufology. So if you miss, oh, the one I won't abide is ufology. <laughs> it's some people use and it fits the, uh, the the term, but uh, nevertheless, it doesn't doesn't fit the reality of the situation, except for certain people. Yeah, yeah. We had a Dr. David Halpert on the show who wrote a very ah uh, yeah. yeah. He's second gen too, and uh, we started out together. So. Yes, that's right. That's right. And he, uh, you know, he, you know, he talks about the. 15th century, 16th century, 17th century Kabbalists, right? Having having similar experiences uh, to to what we now call the UFO experience and experiences with the men in black. Um, and just like you were saying that that you don't necessarily have beliefs, you know, that, that's something that I really kind of struggle with, think about, because I'm always shifting, I'm always changing, I'm always waking up on a different side of the bed. Um, and, you know, it's kind of hard to be in, in flux. Flux. You know, sometimes I wish, you know, I, I should just go around the corner and enjoy the evangelical Baptist church that's there. Um, but uh, and I'm not saying I'm superior to anybody who has a rigid belief system, um, but uh, it's tough. It's hard sometimes. Um, can you tell us how you understand and define Gnosticism and Gnosis? OK, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I tend to go to the Eastern equivalence to the term. Uh, for me, when I say Gnosticism, I am not particularly referring to, although I certainly am aware of it, literate in it, the classical Gnostics of uh, Roman times, because they are saturated as are, I guess, all religions of that period with uh, notions that I find, uh, how shall I put it, but uh, uh, Gnosis needs radical, direct, intuitive knowledge of reality, as opposed to intellectual knowledge or beliefs. In fact, it's the opposite of the notion of beliefs. Um, if you believe something, you take it on faith as currently defined. And as Karen Armstrong has pointed out, the original meaning of, of faith was fides, the Roman term, which is allegiance. So if someone asks me point blank, do you believe in God? Meaning, I assume they mean the Judeo-Christian uh, general idea. I, I would have to say no with reservations, which is to say, if you revise the question, which no, you know, no poll taker is going to do, I would say, 
ask you, do you think that there is a God in the sense of an omnipotent, omnipresent, uh, omniscient being? I would say, yeah, I think so. Do you owe allegiance to that concept? Yes, even if it doesn't exist, I owe allegiance to it because it's one of the great pillars of Western civilization, which I happen to, you know, be a product of. So to me, Gnosis is cutting through that to direct, radical, intuitive knowledge of what is and what isn't. It's not something you can prove through a second person. You can tell them what you've done to reach that point of view, but you can't prove it yourself because it's direct, and radical and intuitive. Have I explained it or just confused things more? No, I, I think you've explained it well. So, um, so sifting a little bit, but uh, coming back to, to sort of your intro, you know, you mentioned uh, trying to explain this bishop title and, and that it's a, a Masonic title. And I, I was wondering if you could explain to us a, a very peculiar and interesting form of masonry known as Memphis Misraim. What is Memphis Misraim? Um, I, I think that you have to distinguish the Memphis Mitrium system from uh, Orthodox Freemasonry. It was quite Orthodox in the 19th century and a rival of what in America is uh, free and accepted Masonry, FNAM Masonry, and uh, also uh, ancient and accepted uh, Masonry the two forms that you get most of in the United States. But those forms are confined to men and in their uh, classical form, they're, they're confined to white adult men. And I don't particularly care for that kind of bigotry in fact, the Ku Klux Klan was an offspring of uh, mainstream Freemasonry. Memphis Mitzrium traces its origin back to uh, the Comte de Cagliostro and uh, as whether what he was doing or saying was uh, embroidered or not, it came forward through the right of Memphis in the early 1820s and then uh, further down the line through the right of Mitzrayim, and then late in the 19th century, because they met with a lot of hostility, as they admit women, they admit people of color, they admit people who are interested in what they do, regardless of race, creed, color, or national origin. Um, the particular Memphis Mitzrayim group that I uh, am involved with is the World Association of uh, Egyptian uh, Freemasonry and uh, uh, organization. And uh, their headquarters is in Yafo, one of the most ancient cities in the world. And if you look at a picture for one of their ceremonies, it looks like pretty much like any kind of Masonic ceremony. But the difference is you will see women, you will see uh, in the divisions that you see in the Holy Land, right behind me here, uh, you will you will see uh, uh, people taking sides. But the truth is, you have uh, people of Islamic Arabic extraction, Jews from Russia, uh, Jewish converts from America. You you have all kind all kinds of people, and that is a reflection of how W A E O operates. So I think that you have, you would call it a liberal Masonic tradition. Now, it is true that in my own work, I have found, uh, inspired by uh, uh, Dr. Michael Bertio, who uh, was, uh, who empowered me at the very uh, beginning of my career, shall we say, outside of the OTO, uh, that uh, Memphis Mitzrayim represents a current that goes beyond the ceremonial mystery plays that Freemasonry 
uh, almost universally uses. And I have found that uh, it is quite the case that there is a non-ceremonial way that one can accomplish the degrees, the many, many degrees in the rites of Memphis and Mithraim. And I'm a promoter of that. There is nothing wrong with the ceremonial initiations. Heaven knows in my OTO days, I was an initiator up to a, a quite high degree. But, uh, um, and I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think that it was, that's probably the best thing that they have to offer. Although it's been corrupted by the present. Oh, I'm not talking about that. Oh, okay. Not talk about them, Alan. Okay. You're talking to your hand, Alan. Um, having a sense of humor, by the way, is what keeps people sane in this area. People that don't have a sense of humor always wind up going down a bad, bad path sooner or later. Or just, I, I, I completely agree. And, and you know, that, that's something I, I, in a way I almost look for, for, for people involved in this stuff, you know, I, I, you, you don't want to make it all a joke or be too light. But yeah, if you don't have a sense of humor, I, I think you're right. It, it pushes people to, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, insanity, the bad kind. That There is something about having a sense of humor about all this stuff. Um, because some of that's pretty weird. That that really uh, that, that really helps in, in, a, in a strange way is grounding. Yeah, that is uh, the case. And there are people that I have known over the many years that I've been involved in this stuff that have, I don't know, gone to the dark side of the force, which I say with a certain amount of humor, but tragically, some of those are suicides. Some of them are just, well, it's not a medical term, but they're nuts, totally wacko. And I still hear from some of these people, but I've stopped trying to say, uh, do you... Think maybe you should see a physician because that drives them. And I, uh, I take all these things with something of a grain of salt, but only a grain. You know, if there is something that is evidential. I mean, I was having a debate earlier today about uh, near-death experiences, and I think there is a very good case for their. They are being a manifestation of something quite real and outside the brain that uh, questions the nature of consciousness uh, in a very big way. But there is a group of people who believe in it, and it's, it's an article of faith uh, in the current sense of the word faith, not in the sense of fighting's loyalty or fidelity, actually, literal. And... Uh, Therein lies madness. But of course, there is a group of people who are equally uh, nuts that uh, are what I used to call professional skeptics. And I happened across the term pseudo skeptics. And since anything they disagree with, they call pseudoscience, uh, I've decided pseudo skeptic is a really good term for them. That is, it's the same people, some of whom I, I do, uh, I'll mention the ones that have passed upon. I knew the amazing Randy, James Randy, very, very well. And uh, I knew uh, a couple of the others that were, that were involved in this. But the, you see the same four or five names all the time. And they're, uh, as far as I know, all members of the American Humanist Association, which has a position which, you know, is fine. But don't tell me that that's science. They are committed to materialism. Uh, they may be ethical materialists, if that's possible, but they are materialists. And by definition, that means that they are going to look for something frantically that explains anything that seems to be outside of the of, uh uh, material science. And the, the funny thing about that is, in my lifetime already, material science has changed enormously from uh, 
but I, I'm trying to think of a specific example. When I was in high school, this again will date me, but that's okay. Hey, uh, when I was in high school, they were teaching that continental drift was a myth. Hmm. Uh, that was early 1960s. Of course, now it's the accepted orthodox norm, and uh, there is an elaborate jigsaw puzzle notion about the breakup of the continents. It's, uh, I, I think people uh, are idolatrous towards science. And the truth is science is made up of scientists. And scientists are just as subject to the bigotries and uh, prejudices that any other human beings are. I am, you are, they are. And in science, there is a consensus of opinions that if you don't toe the line to the entire scientific community comes down on you and even goes to non-scientists. So, uh, uh, it's, I mean, there is a worst case that would be Wilhelm Reich, who I think was on to something that would now be called dark energy that he called war gone. Um, and he wound up going to prison and dying there. And his yeah, body yeah. burned on a beach. You know, that's uh, I, I insane. Agree. And I, I think even people who find Reich kooky, like, you know, his at least he, there, there's a lot of stuff in his early writings that is that is very powerful. And, and of course, I like all of his writings. I, I like his later work. I like his later writings. But, but I think that there's he was on to something, even if you don't want to, to go into the kookiness. And, and you know, to kind of tie things into the classical Gnosticism of, of a couple thousand years ago, you know, you mentioned idolatry. Um, you know, I, I, I think the Gnostics, they took the, the classic Judaic, uh, christo Judaic, uh, um, uh, fear and terror of idolatry to the next level, right? Where you have this, this fake God that people worship. And, and I think that that's a, a really powerful metaphor, something really powerful for the modern day, because it's become kind of a hack ob observation to point out that as society gets more secular, in a weird way, people get more religious. They just find new fake gods to, to bow down to. And, you know, I'm a pretty big fan of science, uh, medical science, all kinds of science. But at the same time, I, I think you're really on to something there where, where people have made that a a new god, and that will be a fake god that will fail them at some point, as is every god that we make for ourselves, as is every idol that we have decided to to put in place. But, um, Alan, I wanted to come back to, to something that you mentioned earlier when we were talking about Memphis Misrium. You bet, so there, there's something like 93, 99 degrees, um, each, I shouldn't say each of them, most of them have a, like, a kind of ritualistic play uh, where the person receives this degree, but, but you mentioned that that you found a way, discovered a way where people can get the empowerment of each degree without this this elaborate setup, without this ritual, without this play. So can you tell us a little bit about that and what that has to do with, with hot points, with Pois Show? The Pois Show, yeah. Um, first of all, I would not urge anyone to attempt to describe the degrees without first being empowered someone who has the appropriate power because it's uh, a very dangerous route but if you have the proper empowerment and you know a good sense of humor that you can spend three three hours a week watching cartoons or equivalent then you probably can use this technique uh, there's a little booklet that I put together very early on uh, in consultation with Dr. Bertio back when we were um, uh, working along the same lines. And uh, I would be glad to send that free for nothing to anybody who you know, sends me a request for it. Uh, it's very hard to describe in you know, just talking on a program with limited time, but basically it involves trans channeling, decoding using the uh, secret cipher of the euphonauts, which is one of my books and also something that is important to me, and uh, uh, obtaining 
the word and password of the particular degree as it applies to the individual. And I base that on the fact that in regular Freemasonry and in Luther's Mitzrayim, there are these signs and grips and words that are uh, kind of extraneous to the content of the degree, kind of, but that are nevertheless part of the process of obtaining the degree. And they usually represent a part of the human body, for example, or a, uh, uh, an understanding of fraternity by uh, a grip, which goes back to the craft masonry of the most ancient sort, or uh, uh, other aspects of that. And when I became aware through uh, reading uh, Dr. Bertio's work that, first of all, he considered Memphis Mitzrayim uh, a gift from well, he would say E.T. or did say, I would say from the ultra-terrestrial sources, which is my take on that. And uh, uh, that being the case, since he also strongly advocated using these uh, hot points or we shall, polyshell, as we say in the South, uh, it could be that we're talking about the same thing in these symbolic initiations that's being discussed in ceremonial mystery plays. And I have found that that is the case in some of my, my most talented, uh, uh, I don't want to call them students now because they are, you know, empowered on their own. So basically, you learn to trance you trance with the idea of that degree in mind. Um, you come up with a phrase from a, a significant book to you. That could be, if you were, God forbid, a Thelemite, would be probably the Bravo Legis. Or if you were uh, an unorthodox Jew, God help you, you would get it from uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. If you were a devout Christian, you would probably get it from Revelations. But uh, or if you were a Gnostic, maybe you would look for the uh, hypostasis of the Archons, which I think is about uh, the Black Lodge, which is my current book. But uh, in any case, you would obtain those same underlying uh, Jungian archetypal facts, which is, by the way, what my... My friend Dave Halpern thinks that the, the entire mystery, I don't know if you'd call it reduces, I don't think he would. Archetypes are profound. Ask, yeah. ask Carl Jung. Ask him now, see what you get. But I think that there is something more, I try to avoid the term objective because I don't think there is any such animal. But let's say more in touch with notions like ultra-terrestrials and uh, other membranes of reality that uh, somehow have portals to our bone. So this is a roundabout answer, but you asked a very, very broad question. But if people yeah. learn the technique, uh, all I can say is try it yourself with, without prejudice. And if you want to run it by me, that's fine. I'll be glad to take a look at what you've come across. And if you, if it's a no sale, which has happened couple of times, I'll politely say, try it again. But if, uh, as is usually the case, if you do it correctly, as in the little booklet that I put together long ago, and that uh, uh, Al Palamas was kind enough to uh, turn into a, uh, a rather nice booklet, as opposed to my uh, 1990s typewritten uh, not so nice uh, form. Um, I, I think that uh, you probably will get some very interesting results. Um, 
Is that answering without answering? Because that's what it sounded like to me. If I was listening to me, I'd think he's not telling us what he's trying to tell us. Well, there's a lot of that going on. That's where gnosis comes in. That's just about what I was, I was going to say. It, it was, you know, that answer was pretty similar to your answer about how do you define Gnosticism and Gnosis, and people will just have to find out for themselves. But for some more clarification, actually, you know, your 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 question leads to a, a question from me. But but you mentioned free Illuminism. What 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 is that? Well, it's sort of what it sounds like, except that I keep getting. Uh, male asking to join the Illuminati. <laughs> and, and forgive me, I don't think the Illuminati has existed since Adam Deshaps was suppressed by the Elector of Bavaria in the 1700s. So, I mean, there was an attempt by Theodore Royce to revive it in the, I guess, 1880s or 1890s, and it didn't go anywhere. So then he founded the OTO, Carl Kelton. Uh, which is another story. But um, pre-Illuminism is sort of the opposite of the uh, lodges of magic, as Madame Blavatsky refers to them, uh, approach to uh, the path to enlightenment, which is to say, Gnosis, which is to say, uh, becoming a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. It depends on the culture, what term you use. Same thing. Um, those systems tend to rely on a teacher or a rigid system of initiation. That would include the Golden Dawn, the OTO the various claimants to the AA, uh, and a bunch others, all of which have a uh, very steady curriculum. Free Illuminism starts out with the premise that there are empowerments that wherever you got them, they should be free for nothing for all, and that once a an individual or a group is empowered either by laying on hands or by being chartered or both, hopefully both, um, what direction they take it in is their own thing. Uh, and what I describe as the great Arabia mountain work, which went on for 10 years, anyone who came in peace to the mountain on a certain day each month in the a warmer butts, uh, and that would be uh, my part of the universe uh, from roughly March to roughly October. Uh, if they asked for an empowerment, they got it. Uh, again, free for nothing. And if they asked for a charter, I would send them uh, some sample charters that were actually uh, in force at that time. It probably still, because they do tend to stick. Uh, for the price of an envelope with a stamp on it. And is that, which is to say, not for the price, but you have to fold one in. I, I get people, as I was telling you before the program, I encourage people to enclose a stamp, self-addressed return envelope because uh, that saves me a lot of time and trouble but other than that, the only thing involved is you have to draw your own charter room, and I'll be glad to show you the general you know, uh, format. I got one today that had one mistake in it that was a technical mistake, and I said, well, if you reverse this, go ahead and send me the charter, and I will sign, seal, and deliver it back to you. Don't forget the SRESE, which is a term that has become sort of obsolete, but hey, that's that's a necessity of my particular circumstances. However, each pre-illuminist is a sovereign unto themselves, and each pre-illuminist body is sovereign unto itself. If, let's say, I charter them, let's say I 
ordain or empower them. Once that is given, we follow a species of uh, the Augustinian doctrine, once a bishop, always a bishop. Once a lodge, always a lodge. And I guess the closest I get to faith in anything is faith in once in power, once charter. I have no ability to take that charter away or to disempower that person. Now, if they turn out to be a neo-Nazi or something, I have the same freedom that you do and everyone else does to say, I don't agree with that. I, you know, uh, I am not in association with that uh, or not. I can choose either way. But the whole point is that they are their own power zone, use uh, Dr. Bertio's term. And power zones have a very interesting way of uh, writing themselves if they're on the path, so to speak. Is that lucid enough? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a really great uh, explanation. Um, so uh, uh, you're pretty prolific. You know, I, I love all of your writing, and, and I'm wondering if you're working on any new books or writing projects uh, uh, right now. Oh, I spent the last year struggling with this book that uh, Olaf Phillips and I have uh, been working on, on the Black Lodge. And let me explain that a little bit because it's not self-explanatory. First of all, I'm constrained to say, just like the term the Great White Brotherhood, it has no racial connotations at all. It refers to the traditional black magic, white magic sort of thing. And I had originally, when I wrote uh, Secret Cipher, The Euphonauts, and the sequel, which was written at the same time, uh, uh, Secret Rituals of the Men in Black, uh, to make it a trilogy. And the way I envisioned it was that the third volume would get away from the numbers, which feature very heavily in the Kabbalistic accounts in the first two books, and go for the secret cheats of the third order, which still needs clarification. People who are deeply into the weeds of magic know what that refers to. It's basically, uh, I think people ironically in Western society who are you know, in touch with this will understand the term bodhisattva from Buddhism more quickly than they'll understand secret feats or uh, the theosophical term ascended masters. Same thing, Lamed Bavniks in uh, traditional Judaism, for their sake is the universe preserved. Uh, 35 righteous people. Um, there are all sorts of the nine unknown in India comes from the same foundation. The numbers should tell you that we don't know the numbers. The numbers may change, but the fact is these are ascended beings who used to be human as distinguished from beings who are never human but who have benevolent intentions towards the human race. We're not talking about archons and the demiurgos. We're talking about uh, the angelic and the positive and most of all, I would think those beings that were part of the human race, but have done the equivalent of taking the uh, bodhisattva oath, which amounts to, we will not go on to nirvana until all sentient beings have achieved nirvana. And given the vastness of the universe that we, maybe universes that we now know, that is a tall order and a long time project. So, uh, well, where do we want to go with that? <laughs> well, if you could bring it uh, the back to the book, what, uh, why, why the Black Lodge? And so you're talking about people who are here helping us. So what's, what's that okay. got to do with, with this book that you're writing? Well, when I got around to considering 
writing it about the secret chiefs, I thought there was a more pressing matter. Uh, my opinion is we live in very dark times that make it a lot darker. I concur. Uh, uh, that would uh, that would be all spheres of life. I think Western civilization is in deep trouble. I think democracy is in deep trouble. I think having grown up under the, the uh, threat of nuclear war during the Cold War, I kind of thought we were done with that. But we didn't pursue disarmament with the kind of vigor that I had hoped. And I think we're dealing with that threat again. And in addition, the sun is acting very peculiar. You know, our sun. And uh, as the universe goes, the nearby star uh, Betelgeuse, and we're not talking about the guy in the movie, we're talking about a star, uh, seems to be about to go supernova. About to, when referring to the whole universe, can be thousands or millions of years, but uh, might be tomorrow. So there are a lot of disturbing elements, particularly when we were speaking about uh, uh, Graham Hancock's view of a comet or an asteroid hitting the Earth 11,000 years ago, for which there's some evidence. There's an alternative theory from a much smaller group of fringe people, which may or may not be true, that the sun had a catastrophic emission which changed everything and brought on the younger dryness. The same evidence is used, different conclusions, different group of people. Um, I don't know whether that's the case, but if that happened 11,000 years ago, and some of the things that I'm seeing in astronomy right now, maybe it happened again. And the minimum effect would be, well, we wouldn't be talking right now, not through this medium, because in theory, all of our records could be erased. Uh, our communications could be down for years, if not decades. And who knows what knowledge could be lost? Um, maybe all of it. Maybe we would have to go back to being phone-led. So, what a faith. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, for, for Gen Y and Gen Z, it would be, you know, catastrophic. And I, I say that with humor, but I also say that, you know, it, it literally is how they live. You know, if it's, if it's not TikTok, it's not real. So well, uh, I decided to write a book about the, the underlying force that is the opposite of the Bodhisattva or the secret cheats, because it is something that was much discussed in the magic during the fin de Chichel of the 19th to 20th century, but it stopped being discussed around 1920 for reasons that I don't know, probably political reasons. Uh, the last was uh, Alistair Crowley's novel, uh, Moonchild, which talked about that open, well, he may have been in Black Lodge for all I know, uh, or at least informed by a being from the, from the Black Lodge. But the, the idea is not a, a bunch of uh, scumbag mobsters who mean ill towards civilization. That's always been true, and it's true of ordinary people, and many of them are uh, doing uh, 10 to 20 to life uh, in prison, and many of them are prospering here, there, and uh, and Abu Dhabi, whoops, shouldn't have mentioned the name of where they're, where they're hiding out. But uh, mostly of the Russian persuasion. But um, we're talking about adepts who advance to a certain point in terms of the Atayim, the tree of life, they have advanced to just below the most perilous path of all, the path of Gimel, the camel, which goes all the way to the, the upper triad of the tree of life. In other words, 
to enlightenment, they prefer to stay in what Crowley called the city of the pyramids, below that. But at the same, because they're afraid of it, it is a risky proposition. Uh, according to the general magical lore, if you fall off, you get eaten by the uh, Lord of the Abyss and turned into nothingness, which I, I believe to be impossible, but nevertheless, that is the mythos. And uh, they take that seriously and don't want to go beyond. But they also don't want to be outright. So people still physically embody, not alternately, those who are ascended but have taken the opposite tack. They oppose. And while I don't think there is an official organization called the Black Lodge, if they call themselves something, I don't know what it is, but there are many manifestations of the Black Lodge and of uh, organizations and individuals who are fueled, uh, knowingly or unknowingly, by the Black Lodge uh, that uh, are counterproductive on the path. There you have my version of the Demiurus manifesting in day-to-day -day reality. So I went to my publisher. We got lots and lots of interference, a lot of different types. So it took us a year not to assemble our stuff, but to, uh, to be able to publish it. And even now, there is some rather vicious stuff that goes on. To me, that just validates what we're saying, that there is a Black Lodge, and they don't like what we're doing, so we must be doing something right. So that is the story of how this book came to be written, and I keep forgetting the name because we went back and forth on that a lot of times, too, but I think it's Secrets of the Real Black Lodge Reveal. Real I, is in there because we want to distinguish it a little bit from David Lynch's uh, Twin Peaks Black Lodge, although uh, Lynch is very close to being an enlightened being himself and was probably deliberately talking about this stuff. He gets a free cop. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it does seem like his Black Lodge is pretty similar to what you're talking about. But that's uh, uh, as good as any place to start wrapping up. Uh, uh, Alan, it's it's been amazing talking to you. I'm really going to be looking forward to, to that. Uh, do you have a release date for the Black Lodge book? Um, I know that it's available. Uh, you can post. It's available on Amazon, Amazon UK, Amazon Canada, I think, has it, uh, and Barnes & Noble has it. Uh, whether they have it in their stores yet, because uh, it just came out like two weeks ago, I don't know. But you can order it through the stores, or you can order it online. I get stuff from Barnes & Noble all the time, and it's, I always order online a bad habit I developed during COVID, you know, don't go somewhere where you can order online. But uh, I would encourage people uh, to, uh, first of all, not to overplug it, but uh, the first two books in that series have been published together called The Complete Secret Cipher of the Euphenox. Eventually, uh, there will be a more complete secrets I could use an ox with this and fold it into because I have the current standalone edition of of uh, the complete secret I could use an ox is a good prelude to the Black Lodge book and I would suggest that you read it. I, I, I admit it to be sort of standalone but it will definitely be a richer experience if you read the the, uh, the, the entire trilogy. Excellent. Okay, well, we'll put some links in the show notes. We'll also uh, link to uh, your homepage and other links of interest related to your work. And uh, I, I think that's it for now, but I uh, hope you'll come back on the show and uh, we'll have a, another conversation about all of this stuff. So, Alan, thanks again so much. God willing, I'll be back. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.